May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. We are giving thanks today for the life of John Chrysostom. Uh, straight up first, Chrysostom is not John's last name. It is actually an, an attribute, a description. It literally means Chrysostas, means golden mouth, because that's who he was. He was an extraordinary preacher, fourth century Antioch. Uh, the, he would get so many crowds when he would preach that literally it was the favorite place for pickpockets to go because there were so many people. And that was, as it were, the word on the street. He was extraordinarily bold, very, very wise, eloquent, and measured. Even though he is known for someone who preached against injustice, both among the clergy, I mean things like the, way to he the pavement on the way to hell are the skulls of priests. I mean, he, he did not mince words. And as well as against the government, in fact, finally, it was his preaching against corruption in government that caused him to be sent into exile. But the story about him more than anything was the fact that he measured, he lived a measured life. He knew he was there by, as someone under divine appointment. And as such, he had a calling, he had a task. And he was willing to, to give himself unreservedly to the task that God had given him, to the appointment that he knew he had before God. And that's actually the source of his power. He was a Christian who understood that he was not a mistake in terms of his birth, nor was he an accident of history, but that God had specifically appointed him and placed him in the very circumstances in which he was in so that God could use him, in fact, as it turned out, in the lives of many, many people. I want to say to you that while on the one hand we have every right to give thanks to God for John Chrysostom, he's now considered in fact one of the doctors of the church, his sermons are in volumes that anyone can read, and they are just as humble as well as pointed as you could imagine. The lesson of John's life was he knew that he was living in a moment of divine appointment. That's why we have the Jeremiah reading. Before I knew you, I appointed you. I have set you before kings. In other words, this man out of the middle of nowhere was given extraordinary authority to be able to speak in a way that literally did change the course of nations. I believe with all of my heart that while God does not raise all of us to be prophets to nations, although some are. It is true for all of us that we are still living in the moment of divine appointment, that we are not accidents of history, that we are not mistakes, and that God has set us in the circumstances that we are in with a very specific sense of, I've put you here to be useful. I have called you to be an instrument for the kingdom. And it doesn't mean you're going to go to Uganda, or you might, but more importantly, to be an instrument from the kingdom among family, friends, neighbors, acquaintances, business associates, all the people that you know, you have, in essence, a job description. Um, to put it in the most succinct way possible, Paul's language is that we would live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. And therefore, even today, in the midst of all of the responsibilities that we have, particularly since convention is 48 hours away, less than, how, God, may I live for you? When I pick up the phone, when I deal with the circumstances of what's going on around me, how may I live for you? How may I live in such a way that somehow I get the fact that this is a divine appointment that God has for me? And to be able to live in those circumstances, really with that sense of not so much the burden of the responsibility as it is the opportunity of the appointment. 
There is a difference. I can hear calling and vocation and living in divine appointment is another obligation under which I must suffer. But I want to say to you that that's not how it's described in the New Testament or in the Old. Quite the opposite. The divine appointment that is given in the book of Jeremiah is immediately followed with, see, I have touched your mouth. In other words, if God has put us in a place of divine appointment, which he has, the promise is, is that God is giving us what we need to live in the divine appointment that he has made for us. That we have within us all that is necessary for life and godliness, again to quote the New Testament, so that we might, by God's mercy, not always get it right or even live flawlessly. I don't even know what that looks like. But that instead, it's a question of availability. Lord, how may I be useful today? So that, in essence, what's really most important is not necessarily all the tasks as it is, the impact that I have on the lives of other people to pray for them, to stand beside them, to walk with them, and to find a way to do whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. That's what it means to live in a sense of divine appointment. That's the secret of John Chrysostom's life. It's not just a natural sense of talent or his connections, any of those kinds of things. It has everything to do with the sense that he had of who he was before God. The same is true for us. The secret of our usefulness is who we are before God. It is the equipment that he gives us. The wonderful sense that we live in the arms of his mercy. And that he flows through us in a way that sometimes we intend and sometimes we don't because we're oblivious. In a way that actually is meant to be a blessing to other people. And the opportunity for God to use us in a way that literally speaks of the kingdom, even in the midst of a simple email or a phone call. That's divine appointment. And that, at its heart, as believing Christians, is what God has given us. Amen.